things continue to be very rocky for you over at the source. Your editor-in-chief, and I believe she was the first female editor-in-chief over at the source, Miss Kim Osorio, she brings a lawsuit against yourself and Ray Benzino. And in this lawsuit, among other things, you guys are sued for discrimination, uh, sexual harassment, wrongful termination. And at the time, this was a landmark case. This is long before the Me Too movement, long before any of these women's groups that are out here now. Kim was on the front line doing something that was pretty much unprecedented, which was taking her case to court. Now, to your credit, the sexual harassment part of the case was thrown out and you guys eventually did lose on the wrongful termination side. But would you say that this was the final nail in the coffin for the source? No, not at all. Um, I mean... I wouldn't call it a landmark case by any means. I mean... To be fair, yes, the sexual harassment part of her suit was dismissed. So congratulations on that. But during those times, women didn't take their employers to court. There were a lot of things happening in the workplace, but it was just accepted whether it was inappropriate or not, these were just the conditions that women dealt with. So her taking that stance uh, at that time, and she had a lot of women who didn't necessarily support her. I, I would say absolutely. That was pretty landmark on her side, no? Well, yeah, but that that implies that there was some validity to the claims that were made, which which there wasn't. Um, you know, first of all, you know, let's make this clear: M misogyny has been a part of hip hop for a long time. You know, uh, you know, calling women out their names and other things that have been in rap songs. That's an issue that hip hop as a culture really still has to deal with today. Um, it's still an issue. Um, at the source, you know, I gave opportunities to a lot of great women and empowered a lot of great women. Some of the top executives, including Kim Osorio, uh, were women. And when that case happened, none of the other women joined her. There was one kind of marginal person that did join her and she ended up phasing out because there was no basis for the case. But all the other top women, vice presidents and heads of other departments, you know, took our side and testified to that fact. Um, you know, there wasn't some crazy terrible exploitation of women going on at the source offices. Um, you know, that case was handled by a lawyer that saw that opportunity, in my opinion, to play that kind of narrative because of the existence of misogyny and the existence of the larger public perception of hip hop being something that was not uh, you know, kind to women or supportive of women. You know, there was a lot of people outside of hip hop, the wider public that had and still have a lot of negative stereotypes that they associate with hip hop. And some of them obviously have a basis, but you know, some of them do not. And some of them are just over exaggerated. Um, so, you know, we had, insurance that covered us. It didn't cost us a dime, that case. Um, as you said, the substantial charges were dismissed. The wrongful termination, to explain how that works in law, if somebody, an employee at a company comes 
to the company and makes a complaint of some kind of discrimination, the company has an obligation to investigate that complaint before they take any actions. Um, and that was where I made a mistake because, you know, we were, we were getting rid of Kim as the editor. That was happening for other reasons. There was a lot of things going on that caused us to make that decision. She had done an amazing job for a number of years, the first female editor of The Source. You know, I, I don't want to take that away from Kim. But the company had made a decision to make a change in the editor-in-chief position. And she found out about it before we were able to take that action. And the moment she found out about it is when, you know, miraculously all of a sudden a complaint appears out of nowhere. Had never been one complaint ever before about anything even remotely along those lines. In 2006, you and Ray are forced out of the company. At some point, the source was valued at over $50 million. You guys are forced out of the company and the artist formerly known as Prince, lawyer, Mr. Londell McMillan, he comes in and buys the company for just under $4 million. So, sitting in your seat today, do you look back and revel in the sense of, you know what, I built this amazing company and without me sitting at the helm, it lost major value? Or do you say to yourself, damn, had I just made some different choices, maybe I'd still be at the head of that company and the source would be relevant today. Because all things considered, this is a company that went from your dorm room to being valued at over $50 million to being sold for less than four to arguably not being relevant in the world of hip hop. How does that make you feel? Well, um, you know, I try to live my life without regrets. Um, and, you know, I went through a lot in those past in those last five, six years that I was at The Source, all the things that, many of which we've talked about here. Um, and, uh, you know, like I was saying earlier, the, the, the final straw was this private equity situation with Black Enterprise, because when they refused to put another dollar into the company, um, that, you know, we, it was basically a stalemate, you know, where I wasn't going to agree to work for them and let them have control of the company. I didn't want that. It, to me, it wouldn't have been in the best interest of the source. And in some ways, you can look and see what happened to the source without me, you know, being the one running it. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm proud of what I did with the source. And I think what's important to me is getting the truth out about myself, about the history of the source, um, and the history of hip hop, you know, because I was a big part of everything that happened in the evolution of hip hop from the late eighties through the early two thousands to, to bringing it to where it is today. This world where hip hop is part of everything, every facet of our society, you know, this is what I was envisioning when I was creating the source in the early years. This is what I saw we would get to a world like this. There's just really one, you know, one main part that I think has got lost along the way, which is, you know, the kind of social and political uh, influence 
of hip hop. So, um, you know, I'm actually, you know, this is a good segue into what I'm doing now because I feel like what I was doing and where I was going with the source at the time, um, nobody has sort of picked up that, that mantle and run with it in the last 15 years and that there's really a void here in the market for a platform that can represent the point of view of the hip hop community authentically across a comprehensive range of subject matters. You know, the source, as you know, was the magazine of hip hop, music, culture, and politics. So, you know, you found fashion, you found health information, you found, um, you know, business information. It wasn't just music, you know, it covered the world, but from the point of view of the hip hop community. And I believe, you know, that all of us who've grown up with hip hop from a young age, no matter how old we are today, no matter where we're from, white, black, Chinese, you know, hip hop influences our way of thinking and our way of looking at the world. And, you know, on a musical level, there's differences. And that's been, in my opinion, a narrative pushed by the music industry. You know, the older people like us might be, uh, you know, I don't say this, but people say, oh, you know, this music out now, this isn't real hip hop. This mumble rap isn't real hip hop, blah, 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 blah. The younger people, oh, you guys are just old and out of touch. So through the music, the, the differences across the generations are being highlighted. But what I see is if you go beneath the surface of the music and you know hip hop is much deeper than music. Um, when you think, when you look at the way someone who's, let's say someone who's 21 today and someone who's 48 today, they may not like the same music anymore. But in terms of the way they look at anything, news, politics, health, social justice, any, anything, sports even, the way we consume sports, I believe as a hip hop community, we have a certain way of looking at things and, and doing things that's different from everyone else. There's a lot of us that grew up on hip hop, but there's still tons of people out there of all ages that didn't grow up on hip hop and have a different mentality. And so what I'm creating today with Breakbeat, I believe uh, has a potential to be bigger than the source ever was. Hip hop is obviously bigger than it's ever been before, globally in every aspect. Um, and, um, but yet, like I said, there's not a platform, uh, a media outlet, a brand that speaks to the hip hop community, represents their perspective on all these things in our lives and our worlds that really matter beyond the music. And that's what's being overlooked. People haven't just, nobody's really recognized that I don't, I believe. And that's why I think Breakbeat can attract an audience from 15 to 55. You know, they're not gonna like everything the same, but there's gonna be a lot of stuff we're doing with Breakbeat that somebody younger and somebody older is gonna be intrigued by, is gonna open their minds to say, oh wow, you know, I was thinking that same thing and nobody ever talks about that. And, you know, that's what I, I see is missing out here. And so, you know, Breakbeat, um, has been launched as, as a podcast network. Um, podcasting is an incredibly, you know, dynamic, fast growing and influential medium. And it's been around a while, but it's clearly going through a, a explosive growth phase. I believe it's something that's going to be around for a long time. I believe that podcasting is, you know, sort of the new, television, the new radio, the new magazines, all that is kind of rolled up into this podcasting world that's that's still growing and emerging. And while there are some good, great hip hop podcasts, and they all are some of the highest rated podcasts out, um, 
there's still, we're still only scratching the surface of hip hop's sort of infusion into the world of podcasting in many different ways, covering many different subjects. Podcasting is a medium that brings new voices, new perspectives, things you don't hear or see in the mainstream media uh, are coming out through podcasting. So I put together a collection of shows and hosts and programs that I think represents, you know, this comprehensive way and, and, and these voices. So for example, uh, the first podcast we've launched is, is Don't Call Me White Girl. Um, she's an incredible talent. This is a woman if you, you might have seen on Million Dollars Worth of Game last year. She was on for several months as a co-host. She killed it on there. She's the one behind the Why You Being Weird to Me craze that's been going on social media. Probably one of the biggest viral moments of the year. That, that's her. Um, and she's got a, a mixture that I think speaks to the, the DNA of breakbeat and, and, and what we really need in hip hop from a media standpoint, which is, you know, she's, she's from the hood. She has a street sensibility, but she's really smart. She's going to make you think. She's going to talk about important issues while she's entertaining you because she's funny as shit. She's hilarious, but she's also going to open your mind up. I think she's, she's one of the people I'm calling my unsigned hype of breakbeat. Another one is Funny Marco. Uh, Funny Marco, probably everybody follows him already on Instagram. You know, hilarious dude, uh, built up a huge following on his own these past few years. But I see, you know, talent in him that can take him to a whole nother level uh, of his career. And so we're, we're, you know, producing a podcast with him that we're going to drop in the next few weeks that I think is going to be very successful. And then um, we're doing uh, highly produced audio journalism. That's a side of podcasting that's enormous. Um, and has exploded in the past five years or so. But there's almost no representation of hip hop in that part of the podcasting business. So for example, I have two big uh, podcast documentaries that were in production on one, I, I believe I talked about earlier, which is the story of the unsigned hype column in an eight part series. The other one that I think is gonna be groundbreaking and extremely important is uh, the Larry Hoover story. And I'm out here in Chicago. I've been out here all year um, in part because I'm working on that story with his family. It's the first time that the family has ever participated in the telling of his story. And most people only know Larry Hoover as, you know, the head of the gangster disciples. And, you know, you'll see him on, you know, America's top criminals series or whatever, but he has an incredible story that's way, way more important and deeper than that. Um, he's the only kind of black gangster from our culture ever that uh, transformed from that and was focused on politics. You know, a lot of people remember him on the Ghetto Boys Resurrection album where he's speaking from prison before he got convicted federally. And he's talking about the importance of voting and the importance of people in our communities in these hoods coming together and affecting change through political action. And I believe, you know, that's why he was put away in the feds where they've had him under lock and key 23 and one for 20 some odd years, can't talk to people, can't see his family. Um, because they knew, like other black revolutionaries, black leaders that were bringing about, you know, change from the ground up, from within the streets, within the communities, when he, you know, stopped focusing on drugs and, you know, things that might have, you know, criminal activities, that was one thing. But when he reformed himself and, and changed Gangster Disciples to growth and development, um, and started 21st century vote 
and registered thousands of voters. He was becoming a political force in Chicago and in other areas here. Like 21st century vote was impacting elections. And he was due out to get out on parole in the early 90s. He was going to get out. And I believe the powers that be knew that and saw him as a threat. And that's when they set him up and put him into federal prison where he's been now, you know, at the ADX Supermax with, you know, El Chapo and the Unabomber and all these type of people. And so anyway, we're telling his story in a 10 part series. Uh, we're going to drop the trailer on his birthday, November 30th. And uh, and then we're going to release the series um, at the top of the year. And I think that's going to be, again, a groundbreaking series. It's so relevant to, to today. I mean, his story starts in the 60s. But, you know, when you look at the gun violence problem here in Chicago, the epidemic of gun violence, you know, you will learn a lot more about why things are the way they are when you listen to this Larry Hoover story. The mainstream media doesn't tell you the, the whole story. They spin a whole different you know, way of looking at these things. Um, so it's a story that is very, very relevant and I think will have an enormous impact and I hope will help him get released and get him home to his family. That story sounds incredibly interesting, and I'm looking forward to hearing it, man. Um, so congratulations on it, Dave. If anybody is trying to get more information or subscribe or just learn more about Breakbeat, where can they follow you? Where can they get more information? Sure. Well, um, so all the Breakbeat podcasts can be found on all the podcast apps, the audio versions of our podcast. So you can go on Apple, Spotify, and you'll find Don't Call Me White Girl. We have another amazing podcast that just came out called Culturati, hosted by Kieran Mayo, uh, legendary, you know, uh, hip hop female journalist um, and executive. Um, and then you can go to the Breakbeat Media YouTube channel. That's where the visual versions of our shows are living. And you can go to breakbeatmedia.com. The website is sort of a hub where you can see everything that we've got going on. You can Follow us on socials, you know, at Breakbeat Media on IG um, and Twitter. And uh, yeah, I, I hope people watching this will, will take the time to go and check out some of the Breakbeat content. And uh, hopefully it'll be inspiring and, and entertaining. I'm sure it will be. And we'll definitely make sure we get the word out. Salute to you, Dave. Um, thanks so much for your time in sharing so many of these important and iconic moments in your life, man. They are definitely part of hip hop history and part of the lives of so many people in this culture. So I wish you the best in the next phase of your life. I wish you the best with break beats. Thank you, Prez, man. Really, really glad we had a chance to sit down and, and do this. Appreciate you and uh, talk to you soon. Thanks, my brother.